player number ones welcome back to my channel this is the metatron speaking and today we're going to talk about we're going to have a discussion about ama and its development throughout the world and i think it's a very uh, interesting very uh, deep topic that particularly fascinates me so let's jump right into it hi there welcome back so when, whenever we look at a suit of armor, whenever we look at a full harness, wherever it might be from, it might be Western European armor, it might be Eastern European armor, Japanese, Thai, Mongolian, Chinese, it doesn't really matter. Whenever we look at a uh, suit of armor, the first thing that, that, that really um, stands out is the artistic value. Some of these uh, sets of armor that we see in museums are absolute works of art. But what's curious in a way is the fact that actually art um, or artistic liberty doesn't really it's not one of the most the most important driving forces that shape armor into what it is so there are other things that today we're going to take into consideration that really give armor its look the so armor looks the way it does out of necessity and this is why uh, it sometimes really puzzles me the idea of uh, how something that is made the way it is because it's, it's basically a need, how it can also be pleasing to the eye. So the first thing I'd like to say, I've written down just a few notes here, is art versus, versus functionality. And of course, in terms of armor, armor is protective gear, it's protective equipment, it's something that needs to save your life and make sure that your soldiers are harder to kill. And of course, this is achieved um, through a lot of choices that uh, armorers had to make and, and of course a lot of experimentation. Now the first thing that we need to take into consideration is that there are two main forces, sort of pressures, that give armor its shape. The first one being body mechanics, the way the human body works, and which is I would say the predominant one. In fact most common ground between uh, among armor uh, has to do with this one. When we see that there are similar shapes and similar concepts and approaches approaches both, for example, in a, a northern Italian suit of armor and in a Japanese suit of samurai armor, we will see common things, and today we're gonna, I'm going to point out some of these. These are dictated by body mechanics. Regardless of different traditions, regardless of different uh, cultural background, uh, the human body is still the same, whether it be a Japanese person or whether it be a, an Englishman okay, or a, or a Frenchman. So at the end of the day, these will reign supreme. But there is a second uh, driving force which is very important and that is the one, I believe, that uh, can creates the differences in, in, in approaches throughout the world in armor when we look at armor as a whole, and that is the weapons. So armor, rather than being, we shouldn't imagine armor being shaped by a hammer, if you will, uh, in, uh, for example, in a in an armory, but that is the way that it's actually made. But armor, the shape armor has, is dictated by swords, by axes, by maces, by war hammers, by all those uh, weapons that armor needed to defend from. And of course, if you look at European armor as a whole, okay, um, it is one of the the kinds of armor in the world which has a, which has a lot of diversity. There are a lot of possible configurations with European armor, and of course, there are a lot of different configurations in samurai armor as well. And this is something that many people misunderstand understand. In fact, I have had people asking me, like, so there are so many different kinds of helmets, so many different kinds of breastplates and armor configurations in, uh, configuration in Europe, um, whereas Japanese armor is always the same. No, Japanese armor is not the same. It, there are a lot of possibilities also in Japanese armor, so the fact that someone feels that it's always the same means that they haven't studied the subject. But given European armor is probably the kind of armor that, which has more uh, possible configurations, although we do need to take into consideration also the fact that when we say Japanese armor, and I'm just giving an example here of course, we could talk about Thai armor, we're talking about the uh, suits of armor and uh, mything techniques and armory techniques of one country against Europe, which is a loads of different countries, which often uh, which uh, are next to each other. Okay, so that means that they, there was constant competition, and armor has a, had certain developments because of the fact that you always have better armor means weapons need to become better. You need more ingenuity, sort of stimuli, you've got a lot of external stimuli, so people come up with better weapons, and therefore now armor has become less effective, so they need to come up with new configurations, new patterns, new ideas, which will make armor again superior to those weapons, so they will have to come up with new weapons, because at the end of the day, when you make armor, it's always a matter of 
sort of a compromise between protection and mobility. It's like you have to imagine it as, for example, you've got like one line and let's say you've got 50% protection, 50% mobility. When you raise mobility to 60%, protection will low, will low and to 40% and, and vice versa. So sometimes there are some choices. In fact, you know, sometimes in, in video games, the approach to armor is always a direct line. Okay, this helmet is better than this helmet and this helmet is the next level helmet, etc. And same for breastplates. But in reality, that's not the way. Of course, if you take a late 15th century foot of, suit of armor and you compare it to an early 11th century suit of armor, the latter will be uh, more effective. That's out of the question of course it's, it's a no-brainer but when you have for example a new uh, kind of helmet it's not that it's just better than the previous one it's just that it's better at some things but for example it gives you grants you better ventilation but the other helmet had better uh, protection so armor is always the uh, result of a fine adjustment between protection and mobility and when we talk about helmets it's a fine adjustment between um, visibility vision and uh, protection and uh, ventilation in fact if you look at for example a frog mouth helmet a sort of helmet which was in its early form maybe it was used also on the battlefield but in the majority of cases particularly the late developed forms which are my favorite uh, it's a jousting helmet it gives you a excellent protection because you've got basically one solid plate here uh, all the hinges are in a way that uh, they you know it's not your body's not exposed as much as other helmets like battlefield helmets but the vision you get there is terrible and the, sometimes there are some uh, versions of frog mouse helmets they, they are completely locked to your breastplate so you can't even move your head inside them and of course breathing is a problem but during jousting it doesn't really matter you know jousting for for like a few hits against another guy and then you can remove the helmet it means you know you can immediately get some fresh air whereas when you're on the battlefield you don't want to remove the helmet possibly for a few hours and uh, because it needs to so it's better to have the ability to hinge up a visor etc so again very interesting concept that of uh, how armor is shaped so again a sort of battle in between weapons and uh, protective gear now when looking at common gra uh, common uh, ground between armor throughout the world for example um, even if the method of constructions are different and some choices are different we have to look at for example the let's let's look at breastplates breastplates throughout the world have a lot of common points for example uh, european western european breastplates most of the times they have uh, two major uh, aspects first off they have the shape they sort of a dome shape if you will and they tend to reach your navel in fact in many games Games, they get it wrong and they get the breastplate reaching basically modern the modern belt the sort of where your jeans have a belt but that is too long for a breastplate and if you have a breastplate like that and a lot of cheap Indian reproductions fail uh, and, and, and do that it's problematic because at the very moment you try and sort of uh, bend to, uh, towards the front the breastplate sort of get gets pushed into your neck and you don't want that of course so real historical breastplate in the majority of cases reaches your navel and then if you do have protection for the lower abdomen it will be a separate plate whether it be a placard whether it be folds there are lots of possible configuration whether it be male okay uh, but and that's a similar concept in Japanese uh, samurai armor as well and I own two suits, suits of armor as you know and whether it be um, Oyoroi or whether it be uh, the later Tose Gusoku of the 16th century um, still again look at, look at the breastplate has a globular shape it looks like a, a dome again it's not completely flat and most importantly it reaches your navel so similar concept why does it reach your navel you ask and that is because of um, the fact that the armor will be uh, it's very important for mobility and it's also important for a weight distribution for example if you think about a tracking a backpack that's basically where you uh, sort of attach the uh, sorry I'm lacking the word now but I think you understand what I'm saying you sort of fasten it there so there are a lot of choices that are made out of need and they are common and we have similar situation for example with uh, weapons I mean look at as, as, as much as we want to say that a European longsword is a very different weapon from a Japanese katana still uh, if you look at historical European martial arts and you compare them in the, in the manuals and, and, and everything and you compare them to Kenjutsu uh, just looking at the guard positions and the stances there are a lot of similar concepts they all they have the upper stance they have they're very similar they're not exactly the same but they're very similar 
Why would you say if they, were, they had no contact at the time and, and they were so distant apart? And that is because at the end of the day, even if there are a lot of different things, the kind of steel used, the way they were forged, these weapons, that one is double-edged, one is single-edged, but still we are talking about a weapon which is basically a long steel of sharp, long steel bar, which is sharp, attached to a handle. So, you know, two-handed. So uh, if we look at the longsword, so very similar concept and so of course they will lead to similar uh, development um, because of the way the body works. Also a last factor I'd like to bring up is the availability of metal, of material in general. And that is also a, a uh, distinct and important factor in the construction of, of armour. In fact, for example, steel in Europe, we had a lot of steel and we had excellent quality steel. In Japan, it was harder to have steel and that's why most of the times, uh, although steel samurai armour existed, you also had sandwiched plates, meaning uh, the back plate was iron, the top plate was steel, which was also a choice. It was not just a matter of we don't have enough steel, it's also a choice because the iron plate is softer, so it helps with shock absorption. But sometimes you also had an entire suits of armor made of iron, and which is even later in the day, okay, even later in, in later centuries. And that is, of course, it's, it's also a matter of availability of materials. Moving on to, for example, armor for women. Um, and I have a, a, a dedicated video to this topic, but in games, again, something that happens is that armor for women is made specifically for women. You've got silly things like, you know, the, the, the shape of breasts, which is absolute for the breastplate. And I know it's called the breastplate, but that's absolutely uh, moronic as an idea. I mean, it looks good. I'll give you that. So if it's fantasy, I'll be okay for that. It'll, it'll, I, I, won't, I can't complain if it's fantasy, but in reality, but we don't have a lot of examples because we, we didn't have a lot of, of, of women fighting in, in armor, historically speaking. There, there were some, but not many. But still, if you have a woman uh, wearing armor, and, and if it's male, it's going to look like exactly the male of a man. Okay, it's the exact same thing. And interestingly enough, same we can say for plate. I mean, look at uh, Joan of Arc. Uh, and all the representations we have of iconography and, and, and pictures and, and imagery uh, of the medieval times which represent her and they often represent her in armor because of the fact that she went to battle as we know the story of Joan of Arc is absolutely fascinating. Um, the full plate harness she had exquisite uh, full plate harness that she wears is exactly the same as the full plate harness of a man because at the end of the day it's still human body and it still functions that way. So again to reiterate Armour has the shape it has out of necessity. And I find it absolutely fascinating that some things we also find appealing to the eye and, and stunning. And for example, if you look at this sort of, uh, sort of armour, for example, and you see how uh, thin the waist is, it looks good. But that's again out of necessity. It helps with weight distribution. If it were better to make the breastplate look like look really fat and bulky, then it would have. But that's not the case, I would say, luckily. Because to me, I mean, I became obsessed with armor uh, when I was very young. And perhaps I'll make a dedicated video to this if you're interested to know when I became obsessed with armor. But um, I always found armor to be one of the most amazing uh, w things of, uh, that humans have ever created as far as art is concerned. But I would like to know what you think about armor. Do, do, do you have a favorite kind of armor? Are you more into European armor or do you prefer Roman armor or do you prefer um, Eastern armor and, and Asian armor? Please let me know in the comments below. I wish to thank you for your time and I hope that you found this video interesting and also thought-provoking. I'd like to hear your opinions of course down in the comments below and I wish to thank you for supporting my content and watching my videos. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.